Good morning, everybody. It is 7 o'clock. A big development concerning Downing Street parties this morning. Could the Prime Minister be facing a police investigation for the Health Minister, Ed Arger, and the Shadow Climate Secretary, Ed Miliband, on the show today? Plus, we'll put the latest developments to the families of those who lost loved ones in the pandemic. It's Tuesday, the 11th of January. Parties and the police, new pressure on the Prime Minister following a leaked email about a bring-your-own-booze Downing Street gathering during lockdown. I'm live outside New Scotland Yard, who say that they're aware of alleged rule breaches in Downing Street and are in contact with the Cabinet Office. Those who lost loved ones are angry. It demonstrates the um, culture at the time in Downing Street and how they viewed the pandemic and how they, well, their contempt, frankly. Medical first, the terminally ill man given a chance to live after trading in his damaged heart for that of a pig's. He's awake, he is um, recovering and speaking to his caregivers and um, we hope uh, that uh, the recovery that he is having now will continue. As new measures come in on lateral flow tests today, can we say bon voyage to COVID stopping our holidays? We'll speak to the chief exec of Heathrow Airport, John Holland Kay, to find out. The clinical trial that uses horse tranquilizers to stop alcoholics drinking heavily. Just like a rolling stone, we'll show you the stamps that will celebrate the rock icons. Also on the programme for you this morning, we're sorry. Ovid Energy apologises for suggesting people do star jumps and cuddle their cats as tips to keep warm this winter. And entering the gates of hell, we'll chat to the explorer who delved deep into this gas crater in Turkmenistan ahead of new plans for it to be extinguished. A very good morning to you. A new problem for the Prime Minister this morning after Scotland Yard said they're in contact with the Cabinet Office following a leaked email suggesting a Downing Street garden party was held with up to 100 people being invited. One of Boris Johnson's top members of staff invited Downing Street employees to make the most of the lovely weather and bring your own booze. One Labour MP is calling on the Prime Minister to resign and families of those following the lockdown rules who, love, who lost loved ones are very angry, as John Craig reports. Bring your own booze. That was the call five days after this photo was taken from one of Boris Johnson's top officials, Martin Reynolds, in an invitation to 100 Downing Street staff to drinks in the Number 10 garden on the 20th of May 2020. Hi all, he wrote... After what has been an incredibly busy period, we thought it would be nice to make the most of this lovely weather and have some socially distanced drinks in the Number 10 garden this evening. Please join us from 6pm and bring your own booze, Martin. Now, after it emerged that the Prime Minister and his wife Carrie were among 40 guests, the PM could face a police investigation. Scotland Yard says the Met is aware of allegations of breaches of Covid rules at Downing Street on that date and is in contact with the Cabinet Office. Labour backs a police investigation and is demanding the PM's resignation. I think he should go. I mean, there's no, ex no excuses and it would come as no surprise that I don't think Boris Johnson is up for the job. But more importantly, I think he's lost the confidence of the British public now with his lies, his deceit and his breaking of his own rules. Mr Johnson has not denied attending the party. You and Carrie attend the Downing Street party that was organised by Martin Reynolds on the 20th of May. All, all that, as you know, is the subject of a, uh, a proper uh, investigation by Sue Gray. That's a reference to the Whitehall enforcer appointed to investigate allegations of several Downing Street parties during lockdowns in England. But bereaved families who've lost loved ones during the pandemic are already outraged. People couldn't go to funerals. Um, we didn't have relatives and friends come to, come to my father's funeral. We couldn't even hug each other, family members from different households. It was, it was an absolutely horrific situation at the time. The PM now faces an anxious wait for the results of the Whitehall inquiry and a possible police investigation. 
His future in number 10 could depend on the outcome of both. John Craig, Sky News. Well, we're joined now by the Health Minister, Edward Arger. Mr Arger, a very good morning to you. Let me put, first of all, to you, if I may, what we heard from the then Culture Secretary on the very day that an event was taking place, uh, about an hour later, on the 20th of May 2020, the very height of lockdown. This is what the Culture Secretary was saying. Those who cannot work from home should now speak to their employer about going back to work. You can spend time outdoors and exercise as often as you like, and you can meet one person outside your household in an outdoor public place, provided that you stay two metres apart. So just to clarify straight off the bat, Mr Arga, good morning. How does that tally with what happened at Downing Street less than an hour later? Well, OK, um, good morning. We've seen and heard, obviously, in recent days, the allegations about what happened. It's absolutely right that Sue Gray, a very senior, um, very well-respected civil servant, is independently looking into these. I wasn't at any um, parties. I don't know um, about these allegations, so it's right they're investigated properly, because, as you alluded to in your introduction there, I can understand we've lost in this country 150,230, I think is the latest figure, of our fellow citizens who've died from this disease. So I can understand that with these allegations, people will be upset and angry, which is why it's right that the Prime Minister asked for that independent investigation to be completed at pace to get to the facts behind these allegations. Would you have accepted the invitation? Um, Kay, I spent my May last year um, talking to you on various occasions and various other um, media outlets, but pretty much glued to my Zoom screen and making sure that I knew what the regulations were, not least because I was a health minister who'd um, helped draw them up. Given that, would you have accepted the invitation? I wasn't, uh, Kay, I wasn't invited to any parties and I'm not going to get into any hypotheticals. I was clear about what the, well, hang on, I was clear about what the rules were at the time and it's right that Sue Gray is looking into this matter independently. Uh, the police said at the, at the time, this is a, a tweet from the police on the 20th of May from the Met Police, they say, um, have you been enjoying the hottest day of the year so far? It's important that we all continue to stay alert. You can relax, have a picnic, exercise or play sport as long as you are on your own with people you live with, just you and one other person. Does it sound as though that is what was happening in the Garden of Downing Street the very same day? Oh. Sorry, Kate, I, I, I don't know um, what did or didn't happen. All I've seen are the report, the email that was reported yesterday and various sources quoted by various media and journalistic outlets. That's why it's right that this is looked into independently by Sue Gray and therefore it would be wrong for me to comment while she's doing that. And equally, while we've heard, um, I think, overnight that the Metropolitan Police have said they're in communication with the Cabinet Office. So given those circumstances, I don't think it would be appropriate for me to comment on what she may or may not conclude, but let her get on with her job with that clear feel without any um, uh, comment from ministers or others and let her reach the conclusion she reaches hopefully swiftly. We've all seen the email invitation. It says, join us. Uh, it's from Martin Reynolds. Martin Reynolds would only write join us if it was from the Prime Minister, wouldn't he? Well, I'm not sure. Um, that's just, as I say, I, I have seen the email. I don't know the context of that email. And I think that you're, um, you're making a leap there in assuming, in making an assumption about the Prime Minister. I'm not going to be drawn on that. I think, that, again, as I say, and I know it will be frustrating for you, but I think it, I have to repeat it because it's the, it's the right thing to do, is that that's up to Ms Gray to look into. And while her investigation is going on, I'm not going to make comments that would prejudge or get in the way of that. OK, so the police were tweeting at the time saying uh, you can meet but just with one other person. Police in Derbyshire were actually putting up drones at the very si same time. This is what they were doing. They were looking to see whether people were walking on their own in the Peak District with or with other people, whether they were walking their dog, whether they were too close uh, and whether they were from the same household. Were the police in Derbyshire going too far that day? Well, I think, and I, this is where I will try and rely on my memory of that time, um, if I recall that the Derbyshire police subsequently suggested, uh, did say that, um, that maybe they had 
um, gone too far on that particular occasion. But what the police were seeking to do, I spoke to my own chief constable in Leicestershire a lot at that time, and his focus with his officers was to inform and educate as the first step, so to intervene and talk to people if, he, if their officers thought that, um, that the rules were not being followed, and only as a last resort to take enforcement action, that way bringing the public with him and his officers. And I do remember the conversations I had with him at that time, back in, I think, May, late May of 2020. You may remember a news conference that the Prime Minister gave on the 25th of May 2020 in response to a question about big groups gathering in parks. Boris Johnson said the only reason we have been able to make as much progress as we have is because this country has observed the social distancing rules. So feel free to speak to people yourself if you feel they are not obeying the rules. But the police will step in if necessary and encourage people to obey the law. Um, if you had seen 40 people gathering in the Garden of Downing Street, would you have stepped in? Well, you're, you're citing a hypothetical there, um, Kay. I wasn't in Downing Street. Um, I don't think I went to Downing Street at all during that period of the pandemic. I spent most of it sitting, as I say, glued to a Zoom or Teams screen. Um, but I think we all, at that time, we remember what it was like. Um, and I think we all, and I think you probably asked me at the time, um, would I, if I, for example, had people next door or in the street having a party or breaking the rules, what would we do? And what would I say? I made clear that I might have um, a quiet word. But I'm not going to extrapolate from that or be drawn on the allegations at the moment. They're being investigated by Sue Gray. So I'm not going to, I'm afraid, uh, get into hypotheticals about that. I think it's important she has the field clear to do her job, to investigate that, to talk to who she needs to, to get that information and reach her conclusions about the facts of what did or didn't happen. If 40 people were gathered in the Garden of Dining Street on the 20th of May 2020, was that against the rules? Well, I'm going to let Sue Gray get on with her job in looking into what actually happened. You're asking me um, a hypothetical there. I appreciate we've seen the reports, we've seen the I'm emails. I'm sorry, Health Minister. I'm sorry, it's not, a, it's, not it's not a hypothetical. It's not a hypothetical. People were gathered hey, in the garden of Downing Street on the 20th of May 2020. Was that against the rules as we understood them, given the facts that I've just given to you at the time? Well, I can set out to you what the rules were and you can form your own conclusions and your viewers will, but I'm not going to prejudge what Sue, Wolf, Sue Gray will find happened on that occasion. So you're in a sense conflating two things. The rules, you're right, you played, I think, Oliver Dowden there, who was coach secretary at the time at the beginning, setting out what the rules were. But what actually happened or didn't happen in Downing Street is a matter for Ms Gray and she will uh, come up with her conclusions having interviewed uh, the relevant people, having looked at the evidence and that she will then conclude A, what did or didn't happen and then B, whether um, anything that did happen was consistent with the rules. But the rules are as you set out, I think, at the outset of this piece as Oliver Dowden um, set out in that press conference. Let's, let's fast forward then to the end of last year. The Prime Minister has certainly said, I've not got any mud or blood on my hands at the moment. There might have been parties going on in Downing Street. I wasn't aware of them. And this is what he said in uh, the House of Commons at the time. I apologise for, uh, for the impression that uh, has been given uh, that staff in Downing Street take this less than seriously. Uh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm sickened myself and furious about that. Want to say anything about that? Well, I think the Prime Minister was, was right to apologise um, for that. As I said, I've, I've been uh, a minister in the Department of Health throughout this pandemic. I've spoken to you a lot on, on each occasion. Um, every day I followed very closely the number of people in hospital, the number of people who sadly and tragically died from this disease. So I can entirely understand, as I said, people's anger and frustration and upset and hurt at these allegations and suggestions. That. And that's why the Prime Minister was right um, to come to the House and to apologise for that. I think he did absolutely the right thing in doing that and in setting up this investigation. He says he was sickened by parties going on at Downing Street. It looks as though he was at least two, at, at least two of them. Well, again, you are uh, citing something based on some reports, some sources, but we don't know the facts, and that's what Sue Gray is going to be looking at. I've, I know Sue Gray. She is an extremely experienced civil servant. Come on, I have to deal with this. She will follow the facts. 
she will follow the facts and she will report on what she finds. And I think it's important we let her do that job. Um, quite rightly, you and others would quite rightly be the first to say, if I started prejudging what she was going to say or seeking to influence it, that that was inappropriate. It would be. That's why it's important. I say I will wait to see what she says, and if she finds any evidence of wrongdoing or rules broken, it's important that appropriate disciplinary action follows that. We've seen the photographs. We've seen the documentary evidence. We've seen what the Met have said. We've seen what the Prime Minister has said. We've seen what the Culture Secretary has said. Rather than the Prime Minister being sickened, shouldn't it be the public that is sickened? Well, I, I've already said, Kat, I can entirely understand why these allegations, these suggestions, these reports, um, will cause um, great upset and anger with people. And that's why it's right that the Prime Minister because at the time, you know, everyone making huge sacrifices, sadly, many lives lost. That's why it's right that the Prime Minister said he wants to get to the bottom of this. He's commissioned that independent investigation. But I'm not going to um, give a commentary on what Ms Gray may or may not conclude, nor indeed, given the news overnight that the Met are in communication with the Cabinet Office, what they may or may not conclude. So I think it's important they're both allowed to have those conversations in Ms Gray's case to conclude that investigation um, and make the findings known. You're looking my viewers in the eye this morning, um, uh, Health Minister. Nobody would have wanted your job this morning. How can you defend this Prime Minister? What I'm saying is very clear. I've made clear, as someone who's been a Health Minister, and as you know, throughout this pandemic, um, I can understand the, the hurt that these reports, these allegations, um, well, of course, particularly for those who've lost um, loved ones. Yesterday I did what I sometimes do, which is walk along the uh, memorial wall on the South Bank, so I know I can entirely understand the pain people have experienced through this pandemic and the pain people have experienced through the restrictions they had to endure, which is why I, I think it's absolutely right that the Prime Minister made the statement he did and commissioned an independent investigation into it. And I look forward to seeing the results of that investigation. That's absolutely the right thing to do. Um, and I hope that Ms Gray will um, report as swiftly as she can. I haven't given you allegations, Minister. I've given you facts this morning. You have uh, cited the email, you have cited um, reports and journalistic sources uh, suggesting certain things. It's important that Ms Gray, as an independent figure, um, an independent civil servant, looks into this and is able to investigate it fully and has the uh, feel clear for her to do that. Likewise, um, that the police, who said they've been in communication with the Cabinet Office, again, are able to have those conversations. It wouldn't be appropriate in that context for me to comment on those ongoing conversations or her ongoing investigation. We've got to give her um, the space to conclude that investigation, to speak to whoever she needs to, and to reach her conclusions without fear or favour. When will we hear from her? Well, I, if I recall, I think the Prime Minister said he wanted her to conclude this investigation as swiftly as possible because people wanted to know um, the answers. But that is a matter for her because um, I think setting an arbitrary timeline um, would risk um, limiting her being able to go where she wants to go and pursue whichever lines of inquiry. But I know he was clear he wanted this to be a swift investigation, a swift report to get to the bottom of, um, of the allegations, which I know is what the public would want too. And do you feel it's now right that the police are involved? Well, I've seen, saw the reply, I saw the report overnight saying that they were in communication with the Cabinet Office. Um, I shouldn't comment further, and that's a matter for the police. Um, but they, as ever, throughout this pandemic, they will make operational decisions, and, and that is a matter for them to decide um, what to pursue, what conversations to have. Um, but I do note that they've said they have had conversations or in conversation with the Cabinet Office. As I said, Minister, few would envy your position this morning, um, having to defend uh, what is across all of the newspapers and most of the broadcast media. We appreciate you taking the time to join us. Thank you. Thanks, Kay. The Met Police say they're in contact with the Cabinet Office over the Downing Street party on the 20th of May. We've sent Shingy down to New Scotland Yard to bring us more. Shingy, good morning. Good morning. Tell me more. Uh, so we now know that the police are the police are in contact with 
the cabinet office, something that they confirmed yesterday after widespread reports of though that party breaking the rules in Downing Street on May 20th last year after that email was sent out by Martin Reynolds inviting people to bring their own bottles and enjoy the warm weather in the garden of 10 Downing Street, according to allegations. And of course, England was under strict lockdown measures at the time the party took place, which is why there is so much fury about what has happened. At the time, you could only meet one other member from another household outside, and you had to stay two metres apart. But on the same day, the Metropolitan Police even tweeted a message reinforcing those restrictions. They said that you can relax, you can have a picnic, exercise or play sport as long as you are on your own or with people who you live with or just you and one other person. Even on the same day, Oliver Dowden, the then culture secretary, spoke at Downing Street saying the same thing, making sure that people stuck to those rules. But at the same time, that email was being sent out and a number of people are understandably furious. Number 10 have refused to comment so far. They're simply saying that they want Sue Gray, that senior civil servant, to complete her investigation into lockdown breaches before they say anything further. OK, for now, thank you. See how this morning's papers are covering that party, should we? Starting with The Guardian says there's fury over it with over 100 people sent invites. The Metro calls it Downing It Street and notes the Prime Minister and his wife Carrie both attended, according to reports. The email was an invite you do to what you like, in the words of The Express. And The Express urging the Prime Minister to end what it calls the party gate farce following the revelations. Still to come on the programme for you, what do Labour make of the most recent Downing Street party revelations? We'll find out with the Shadow Climate Change Secretary Ed Miliband a little later. We hear from a former advisor to Vladimir Putin as tensions rise between Russia and the Ukraine. And at half past eight, can we say bon voyage to Covid stopping our holidays? We'll speak to the chief exec of Heathrow Airport, John Holland Kay, to find out. In other news, a terminally ill man has been given a chance of life after doctors replaced his heart with a genetically modified pig's. A warning, this report from our US correspondent Greg Milam includes pictures of the operation from the beginning. This is the heart that could give hope to hundreds of thousands of people around the world. In a Baltimore operating theatre, the organ taken from a pig about to be transplanted into the body of David Bennett. The 57-year-old handyman was ineligible for a human heart transplant, his own heart failing, and so ill, he told his surgeon he was willing to give the experimental procedure a try and perhaps make history. He simply didn't want to die, doesn't want to die. And um, he felt that if he had no opportunity, and he was pretty well convinced by multiple doctors who had told him he had a fatal disease and he was unlikely to leave the hospital because of it. Attempts at transplants like this have failed in the past because the patient's body rejects the animal organ. This time, the pig had been genetically modified to lower the chances of that happening. He's awake, he is um, recovering and speaking to his caregivers, and um, we hope uh, that uh, the recovery that he is having now will continue. And four days after it began beating inside Mr. Bennett, it is still going. He's now breathing on his own. It is a game changer because, uh, you know, now uh, not, uh, we will have these organs readily available if this works and, you know, and I hope it will work. Doctors say the next few weeks will be critical for Mr Bennett and for whether a quest that's gone on for decades, finding an answer to the chronic shortage of human organs for transplant could at last be solved. They say this is a first tentative step, but one towards the day when the world isn't limited by the supply of human organs and an end to the years those waiting have to endure. Greg Milam, Sky News, Los Angeles. Looking at some of today's other headlines, we now will start with a story that we warn you some viewers may find very distressing. An 18-year-old US woman was caught on camera throwing her newborn baby into a refuse disposal skip along the Texas border. Alexis Avila was charged with attempted murder and child abuse after her son was found by a group of people more than six hours after being abandoned. 
But luck was on his side as a group of people searching bins happened upon the infant in a black bag after initially mistaking him for an animal. The owner of the skip, Joe Imbriali, says the act was evil. I said, what is it we are looking for? And she goes, we're looking for somebody that dumped a black garbage bag in your dumpster. And I turned around and said, please don't tell me it was a baby. Who does it? That is evil. That is just, I, I don't have words for it. Looking at the latest COVID data in the UK for you now, and there were 142,224 new cases of coronavirus reported on Monday, 77 more deaths, taking the number of those who've died within 28 days of a positive COVID test to 150,230. Low doses of ketamine could help people with severe alcohol disorders to stay sober. Research from the University of Exeter shows that the drug, which is a powerful anaesthetic for humans and animals, has been shown to be successful when used alongside therapy. North Korea's fired what appears to be a ballistic missile into its eastern sea, its second weapons launch in a week, as its leader Kim Jong-un promises to bolster the military. South Korea reported the latest launch and says the missile travelled at more than 400 miles to a height of 37 miles at a speed of Mach 10. After a fire in a New York apartment block killed 17 people on Sunday, investigators are now trying to determine what caused the building's safety doors to fail. It was this that allowed the smoke to rise throughout the building, leading to the city's deadliest fire in 30 years. Robert Durst, the wealthy real estate heir and convicted murderer, has died in jail. His lawyer says the 78-year-old serving a life sentence for shooting his friend Susan Berman in 2000 succumbed to several health issues. I had more money than I could spend and it didn't make me happy. She talked on the telephone with her husband, then she vanished. Durst discussed his crimes and several damning statements in the six-party documentary series The Jinx, The Life and Deaths of Robert Durst, a show that made his name known to a new generation of people. In other news, the Defence Secretary has vowed that Britain would stand up to bullies amid fears of an invasion into Ukraine. Nearly 100,000 Russian troops have been gathering near the Ukrainian border, but the country denies it's planning to invade. We heard from the Ukrainian ambassador, who says they're ready for a fight. Those 100,000 troops are camped on your border as we speak. If they start to move across the border, what do you see the next move being? So many dead bodies will be returned back to Moscow and Kyiv, that's for sure. And whether he will use the, the, the full extent of his might or just very limited to show us and the West that we have to get back to the table of negotiations. But we're already at the table. He doesn't have to move. If he moves, we will be fighting. We'll be speaking to a former advisor to Vladimir Putin as tensions rose between the Ukraine and Russia. Meantime, Ovo Energy has apologised after one of its companies made a blog post about how to stay warm without turning on the heating. The blog, sent out by a division of Ovo Energy, offered 10 tips on keeping warm in the winter without turning up the heating. Options included doing star jumps to keep warm, as well as eating porridge, keeping your oven open after cooking and cuddling your cat. The advice was called offensive by some MPs as many UK households struggle to pay the bills under rising energy costs. This is their apology. We understand how difficult the situation will be for many of our customers this year. We are working hard to find meaningful solutions as we approach this energy crisis. And we recognise that the content of this blog was poorly judged and unhelpful. We are embarrassed and sincerely apologise. See if you can leave the heating this morning. Look forward to brighter skies. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Cloud and rain over England and Wales will clear across the southeast today, leaving it mostly fine through to the end of the week, but with a risk of fog and frost. Scotland, the northern English counties, Ireland and Northern Ireland are mostly dry and clear now, but the northwest has some blustery showers. The weather. Sponsored by Qatar Airways. 
Now, this year marks a very special anniversary for one British rock band. 60 years of the Rolling Stones. And in order to mark their six-decade-long legacy, 12 postage stamps have been commissioned as a tribute to the band. Current members Sir Mick Jagger, Ronnie Wood and Keith Richards have worked closely with the Royal Mail to produce the stamps that capture the band's history. Let's have a look at some of the other stories in this morning's uh, papers, should we? This is the eye. A lovely fiery sky captured on a beach in the northeast. Dog walkers out early enjoying the sunrise at Whitley Bay in North Tyneside. Uh, let's take you to Suffolk, where a giant statue of a man without any clothes on has been distracting motorists. It's East Danglia is the sun's headline, with the newspaper saying drivers in the village of Yoxford have been forced to slow down as they drive past the 26-foot bronze sculpture. And it's become one of the trendiest hobbies since the start of the pandemic, wild swimming. In this picture from The Telegraph, 41-year-old Rachel Whitfield is seen taking her 365th dip in a row on New Year's Day in near freezing temperatures. She's raised £1,600 for a Lido near Portsmouth. We'll be speaking to a woman who lost more than 20 stones by sea swimming regularly later in the programme. Her name, Kathleen Wooden. Kathleen joining us later. Still to come. We'll be seeking to former British number one Andrew Castle to get his take on the events currently unfolding in Australia. That to come. My of our top stories for you this morning. Labour calling on the Prime Minister to resign after it emerged that he attended a gathering in the Downing Street Garden with around 40 other people during the first lockdown in May of 2020. The first of its kind cross-species heart surgery that gave a terminally ill man a second chance at life. And how a clinical trial may prove low doses of ketamine can help alcoholics refrain from drinking more. Earlier I spoke to the Health Minister Edward Arger about the latest Downing Street party allegations. He said he understood why the public could be angry hearing about the Downing Street gathering. I wasn't at any um, parties. I don't know um, about these allegations, so it's right they're investigated properly. I can understand we've lost in this country 150,230, I think is the latest figure, of our fellow citizens who've died from this disease. So I can understand that with these allegations, people will be upset and angry, which is why it's right that the Prime Minister asked for that independent investigation to be completed at pace to get to the facts behind these allegations. Quite rightly, you and others would quite rightly be the first to say, if I started prejudging what she was going to say or seeking to influence it, that that was inappropriate. It would be. That's why it's important. I say I will wait to see what she says, and if she finds any evidence of wrongdoing or rules broken, it's important that appropriate disciplinary action follows that. Tomorrow is here. Tomorrow's take at nine o'clock, of course. Um, how much longer can the government hide behind this Sue Gray investigation? Morning, Kate. Well, look, this is the most exposed the Prime Minister has been since these allegations of parties first emerged. This is not press officers, people you've never heard of, having a few drinks at their desks. Eyewitnesses placed the Prime Minister himself at this gathering. We've got an email in black and white organising it. It wasn't a meeting at which a few drinks were picked up. It was organised as a drinks party only an hour after a government minister had stood in number 10, setting out these tough rules for the rest of us. You can only meet one person outside. And then, as well as this investigation by Sue Gray, which may or may not lead to Downing Street, resignations. You've now got the threat of a police investigation. They didn't want to investigate before when there are allegations of parties, but now there will be huge pressure on the Met to at least ask a few questions. So you've got, at the very least, the Prime Minister needing to provide an explanation of his involvement in what looks like a culture of parties in Downing Street during the height of the lockdown. OK, thank you. Well, the Prime Minister has um, repeatedly denied that rules were broken in Downing Street during lockdown. Have a listen to this. All guidance was followed. All the guidelines were observed, continue to be observed. Those were people at work. Those were meetings of people at work talking about this is where I live and it's where I work. Uh, those were meetings of people at work talking about work. I apologise for, uh, for the impression that uh, has been given uh, that staff in Downing Street take this less than seriously. Uh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm sickened myself and furious about that. The evidence I can see is that uh, 
people in this building have stayed uh, within the rules. If that turns out not to be the case, and, and people wish to bring uh, allegations to, uh, to my attention or to the, to the police or, or whoever, uh, then of course uh, there will be uh, proper sanctions. Joined by a former government special advisor, Claire Pearsall, who now sits as a Conservative councillor for Ash and New Ash Green in Sevenoaks in Kent. Hello to you. Thanks for joining us this morning. Um, how much pressure is the Prime Minister under today? I think he's under enormous pressure. We've all seen uh, the email that has come out from his private secretary, which is quite damning, inviting over 100 people uh, to a party in a garden when the rest of the country were on quite restrictive lockdown measures. So I think that he really does now need to come clean as to whether he was at the party. Lots of people have said that he was. Witnesses who were at the party themselves said he was there. So um, we keep being told we'll have to wait for the report into that. But something that you can probably advise us on, if you would please, this morning, Claire, is um, that that's the invite to the party. Apparently sent out to something like 100 people, about 40 people um, attended. The email was sent out by one of his, uh, his private secretary, what sort of role is that in Downing Street? Do they do things like this without the Prime Minister knowing? I would very much doubt it. The private secretary works on behalf of the Prime Minister in this case. So, so to send out an email that says, we thought it would be nice, or words to that effect, means that the instruction would have come down from the top. So I think that Martin Reynolds, the author of this email, taking all of the flack and the can for the email going out is wrong when that instruction would have come down from the Prime Minister himself. Who do you think the we refers to? I can only assume that it is referring uh, to the Prime Minister uh, plus the private secretary himself working on behalf as a conduit of this information on behalf of the Prime Minister. Why would they send out uh, an invite like this? We have to remember what was happening at the time. People were being stopped by the police. They were being surrounded by the police for going for a walk with a friend. Well, I think that is a really, really good question as to why this has been put in an email. It does seem to have not been thought through whatsoever. Um, but what is surprising that it has taken 18 months for this email to surface. Now, it was sent to 100 people and allegedly only 40 or so attended. But what about those people who felt it was inappropriate to do so? Why wait so long to reveal this information out to the general public? What's the... I mean, you're, you are, still represent the Conservative Party, don't you, as a councillor. What's, what's the mood of grassroots Tories at the moment? There's a lot of anger around at the moment. It just seems as if we come through one crisis and another one emerges. And there's only so many times you can say, look, I'm here as a local councillor, I'm here to look after bin collections, make sure that, you know, in, in, make sure the roads are, are fixed with the county council. But people aren't going to buy that for too much longer. We are all going to be tarred by the same brush, that we are either in some way responsible, that we are part of the problem. And that isn't the case when you're a local councillor. You are here for your local community. So a pretty stark tweet, actually, yesterday from Ed Davey. I um, don't know if we can uh, show it to our viewers. Um, the leader of the Lib Dems, of course, he says, yet again, it's one rule for Boris Johnson and another rule for the rest of us. This time, a massive garden party at his place while people were dying alone. And at the end, he puts FFS. I think we all know what that means. Um, how do you see the situation developing for the Prime Minister over the next few days and perhaps weeks? He, he is losing respect, isn't he? I think this is going to be an incredibly difficult time. Uh, it'd be interesting to see what is brought up in the chamber today. I know that there are allegations made that he could have misled Parliament. So we'll see if that is brought up in the chamber and whether the Speaker will take them to task um, in that matter. But this, unless it is dealt with head on this morning, is going to drag out for the rest of the week. And I'm not convinced that he can hide behind the Sue Gray investigation for too much longer. And taking it head on, what does that look like? I think he does need to come clean. People are suggesting that he was at the party with his wife and it's now time for the Prime Minister to stand up and say whether that was true or not. And if he was, 
Ben Watt. Well, then I think the appropriate sanctions needs to be made. And, you know, I don't wish to hide behind the Sue Gray investigation, as I've just said, but she is tasked with investigating it and the punishments will be handed out after that. And I think it's appropriate that we do wait for her report. And I hope that that will be quick and coming out. Can he survive this? And is it that he had these parties that, you know, we've seen uh, documentary evidence that he did, or is it that he has consistently denied any involvement? I think it's a bit of both, to be honest. When we were looking at sort of the back end of last year when the uh, allegations of other parties came out, there was an awful lot of anger. But then we had the Christmas period, everybody was continuing on with their lives. And I should imagine that the Prime Minister hoped that this would die down. But unfortunately, to see now a drip of more information of rule breaking coming out, I think this is going to be incredibly hard for him to survive. So you think he may well lose his position? Well, that, that really is a matter for himself. He's got to assess whether he considers his position to be tenable going forward. We are running into uh, local elections coming up uh, mid this year. That's going to be quite tricky for those candidates who are up for election. So it really is now down to the Prime Minister to decide what is best for the party and for the country. Thank you for taking the time to join us this morning. Thank you. We're hearing what Labour thinks about the latest allegations about uh, events at 10 Downing Street in the uh, next hour here on Sky News, the breakfast programme. Meantime, the governing body of men's tennis has described the controversy over Novak Djokovic's visa as damaging on all fronts. The status of the visa is now once again in question as the original decision still stands, a chance of being overturned. Joined now by Nicole, who is uh, live in uh, Melbourne for us. Busy day for you yesterday. Um, is he going to stay? Is he going to play on Monday? That's what everybody wants to know the answer to. That's the big question right now. Uh, we really don't know. We're waiting to hear from the Immigration Minister, Alex Hawke. We've been waiting all day Tuesday and it's now almost 7 o'clock local time in Melbourne. No word has come out. The government has confirmed, though, that they're looking into whether Novak Djokovic provided a false information in his travel claims into the country. So when you arrive into Australia, you have to say which countries you've been in in the previous two weeks. He said that he hadn't been in any countries, but it has since turned out that he had been in Spain. So that's what's being investigated at the moment. It seems to be delaying any announcement. So for Novak Djokovic's legal team, it's still in limbo. He's playing, though. He's uh, on the court training, trying to make up for lost time. We've also had a response from the men's tennis governing body. They have said that they respect all the sacrifices of the Australian people during the lockdowns, but that in travelling to Melbourne, it's clear Novak Djokovic believed he had been granted a necessary medical exemption in order to comply with entry regulations. They then went on to say the series of events leading to Monday's court hearing have been damaging on all fronts, including for Novak's well-being and preparation for the Australian Open. So no real clarity on whether he will be able to play in the Australian Open, which is less than a week away now. He's lost out on a lot of his training time, but he's now trying to get on the court and make up for that. OK, thanks very much indeed. Thanks a lot. Joined by former British number one Andrew Castle now. Hi, Andrew. Um, even if he does play, what sort of impact will all of this disruption have on his game, do you think? Well, I mean, he's good enough that he could probably win wearing um, body weights and an ankle tag. He's, he, you know, he's that good a player. He's 20, 25 percent above uh, anybody who's not in, in the top 10. And he's better than that lot as well. Um, he's a very determined and a very stubborn competitor, both uh, on court and off in any dealings that you have with Novak Djokovic. You know you're up against it, be it across uh, a net uh, or, or in a business sense. He's got a great team around him. They've stayed patient and they've watched this thing uh, unfold. I mean, he's won, as Nicole was saying there, and incidentally, how good did the River Yarra look uh, behind her at this time of the year when the skies are grey? Um, you know, Australia heralds the start of a new year. He always comes into the Australian Open fresh, as most of the players do, because they finally get a rest after a long tennis year, which normally ends in November for them. But this certainly will have taken its toll. But after two or three matches, uh, he might be able to cruise through them and, and find some form. But, I mean, it, it's, it's interesting, isn't it, that... The, the, uh, with respect to the story beforehand about Downing Street parties, that allegation or any allegation 
of, of hypocrisy here and one rule for them and one for, rule for others, especially when people have been through a, a bit of hell like we all have in Australia more than most. Um, they, they really, you know, the public really react very strongly to that. Was Novak Djokovic given special treatment or not? How does Alex Hawke now, the immigration minister, decide whether or not uh, under the Migration Act to, uh, to, to ask, or not, or not ask, but to demand Novak Djokovic to, uh, to leave the country? I mean, he's won one court case, but that was uh, on a procedural matter, although the judge uh, did criticise um, the, the government and said, what more could Novak Djokovic have done? It was technical. It was procedural. Now, under sweeping sovereignty powers on, under the Migration Act, he could still go. It's all, uh, all up in the air still. What sort of reception do you think he might receive once he's on court, <laughs> given, as you said, that uh, people, well, good people of well. Australia have um, had to deal with very strict lockdowns, even stricter than we've seen in the UK? Absolutely. Um, the reception that he will get will be to be booed roundly, I'd imagine. Um, his security will certainly have to be beefed up as well. I mean, this is uh, taken on a different order of emotion. You saw the scenes when uh, he emerged yesterday into that, uh, that, that black limousine and people were, were jumping on the car and, and the police had to pepper spray those who were supporting Novak Djokovic around the car. So emotions are running very high, not just in the Serbian Australian community, but for uh, Australians uh, in total. Look, I mean, I, I would imagine that once he takes to the court, that would feel like a place of uh, real uh, safety and solace for him. And let's be honest, he's never been as loved as his two greatest rivals, uh, Rafa Nadal, Roger Federer, and, and to a point, Andy Murray as well. So whenever he takes the court, kind of, you know, he always likes to feel that the world's a bit against him and he's got something to, uh, to, to, to get the adrenaline going. But well, this will certainly be a test for him. But whether or not he'll get the chance to actually tee it up and try to win these seven matches in the Australian Open for a tenth time, um, I don't know. There's going to be a, a, a hell of a reaction to this if the immigration minister sort of flies in the face of the sentiment of the uh, original court and kicks him out. I, I guess that will be decided today. Yep, we'll have to wait and see. Andrew, it's good to talk to you. Thanks very much indeed for joining us. Thank you. Well, we know jo uh, Jovovich um, actually tested positive, didn't he, for COVID on the 16th of December last year. It probably took a lateral flow. We all do them, don't we, at least a couple of times a week. And people around the world have been taking them for many months now. But what becomes of the used tests? Some have been coming up with creative ways to make the most of their lateral flows. Like this, a rectangular shape. One Twitter user arranged his used lateral flows to recreate his very own Stonehenge. Uh, David Levin took to Twitter to share the work of his friend's cousin, who he described as a lateral genius. That's amazing, isn't it? And finally, one of our own, our producer JJ, made his Christmas tree a little more COVID friendly by accessorising his angel with a negative test. He had been positive before that. We're glad he's better now and part of the team uh, again. Uh, send us your pictures. What have you been doing with your lateral flow tests? Um, and if you are quarantining at the moment or if you're recovering from uh, COVID-19, our thoughts very much uh, with you. Our regular doctor, Dr Lloyd, has got COVID again, but he is still going to talk to us a little bit later on. So more of that to come uh, very shortly. Meantime, a quarter of cancers in the UK have a five-year survival rate of just 16%. And yet NHS data shows that early diagnosis for these less survivable cancers, such as lung, brain, and pancreatic cancer, cancer, I should say, is often dismissed. Uh, Bryony Thomas was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer in 2019, five years after she first reported symptoms. She's with us. Hello to you. Good morning. How are you? It's seven years since I reported symptoms, two years wow. since I was diagnosed. Wow, that's amazing. How are you feeling? I'm very well today, thank you, and delighted to be here with you. Yeah, we're thrilled that you are as well. Pancreatic cancer, one of those cancers that people think that is a death sentence almost as soon as you hear the news. What happened in your case? Yes, well, you know, they're not wrong. Um, the survival rate is only 7% for pancreatic cancer. In my case, I was diagnosed on emergency admission to hospital, having been to my GP for over five years with vague symptoms like fatigue, like bloating and not very nice things in the toilet. And these are the sorts of things that people put off going to their doctor about. They're embarrassed to talk about it and medics dismiss. So after five years, I went yellow, a symptom that couldn't be ignored. I dialed 111 and I was admitted um, on emergency admission 
four days later, I was told that I had pancreatic cancer. So what needs to be done to diagnose people like you earlier? There are two things that I can see. So the first is that vague and um, un non-specific symptoms like fatigue, like um, indigestion, like persistent coughs, if there's something unusual with your body and it is persisting, then you need to persist too. Go, keep going and keep trying for answers. For the medics who dismissed me, and it's, it's not an unusual story, I see this all the time in our patient community, people who've been going for years. What I would say to medics is that if somebody keeps coming back and even a flicker goes through your mind that this person might be a hypochondriac, I want you to think, could it be cancer? Because if someone keeps coming back with fatigue, keeps coming back with indigestion, something is wrong. And the answer might be a deadly cancer like mine. OK, um, but we all know what's happened as far as the pandemic is concerned. It's had a, a brutal impact, hasn't it, on people being able to go to see their doctor and also for cancer diagnosis. It's even more challenging at the moment, but I'm guessing even more important that you push forward. Oh, incredibly so. I think um, these are the sorts of uh, symptoms that people dismiss in themselves anyway. And over the pandemic, they've not wanted to bother their GP. And for pancreatic cancer, which affects generally an older generation, I'm, I'm unusual, although it's an increasing in incidence in younger people. These are the sorts of people that aren't particularly comfortable having appointments on video. So they put it off. They don't want to bother their doctor. Their doctor thinks, oh, it's just a bit of indigestion. They'll be fine. And oh, they're a bit of a nuisance. Um, and you know, people also are embarrassed at talking about some of these symptoms. And so are doctors. Doctors talk to me in euphemism about my digestive system and euphemisms have no place in medical circles. Okay, uh, I'm pleased to see that you are uh, well this morning and we appreciate you getting up early to talk to us on the programme. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, still to come in the next hour here on Sky News. My goodness me, we've been speaking to the health minister this morning um, and he was talking to us about a party uh, that happened at Downing Street, the invite, we've seen it, inviting more than 100 people to an event in the garden of number 10 Downing Street. That event was held less than an hour after the then uh, Secretary of State for Culture, Media and Sport had spoken to all of us and said that we could only meet one other person in the open air. This was in May of 2020, when the police were putting up drones in Derbyshire to make sure that if people were walking their dogs, there were only two people there from the same household gathering together. The Prime Minister and his wife, it's reported, were at a party, a picnic, in the garden of Downing Street. We'll put that to Labour in just a moment.